Hi everyone, Melanie. Um, Ehud and I are going to spend um, quite a bit of time talking through what password attacks we're seeing at Microsoft um, through all of our uh, customers and, and networks that we connect to and then talk about some of the different MFA options and the executive order and how you can meet those guidelines and steps to take in your company. And then we're really excited to have Joe here from Accenture. Um, he's in their global IT organization and he's going to share their story about how they implemented passwords for their own employees and, and uh, kind of their learnings from that. So um, why prioritize strongest auth? So there's three bars in here, breach replay, password spray, and phishing. And you can see it's you know, drastically rising for phishing being a top attack for companies. 75% um, of organizations experienced a phishing attack in 2021. Um, we expect it will continue to grow. In fact, we're going to have our newest um, Microsoft Digital Defense Report out in a few weeks. If you want to follow along, it's aka.ms slash mddr. Um, but, so this is starting in 2021, but it's just grown exponentially. And even though that number, 2.9%, seems small, it really only takes one person to uh, make a mistake and give in to a phishing email for an attacker to get access to your network. We've seen the number of password attacks, just to make this real for you, increase um, almost double in the last year. So now it's 921 password attacks per second. Uh, you've seen headlines for Nobelium, Colonial Pipeline, we've talked about this conference, and a lot of times they're using spear phishing, they're using password spray. Um, it's really at the core of a lot of these attacks. Um, this is just a sample also from the MDDR report of different nation state actors. And um, again, across all of these, identity uh, attacks have been at the core. And um, you, we can't really see the, the map in the background, but um, the United States is a primary uh, target for a lot of these attacks. Um, Ukraine was as well, as you can expect. Um, government is also a top um, attack vector or attack sector uh, for this uh, types of attacks that we've seen. So you really have to um, put your defenses forward. And um, we're going to have Ehud now talk about what the U.S. government has been doing in regards to the executive order. Thank you, Melanie. So. As, as Melanie introduced the, the problem, right? Passwordless are, uh, sorry, passwords are problem, passwordless in the answer. And let's look at what the US government is doing. So executive order 14028 was issued back in May of last year where it's calling for the federal agencies to embrace a zero trust architecture uh, for improving the cybersecurity. That was followed by a memorandum by the Office of Management and Budget in January of this year that provides zero trust, uh, basically, strategy. And zero trust is not an unfamiliar concept, right? Microsoft has been practicing uh, zero trust for the last decade. We've helped thousands of customers to deploy zero trust. Now, it's easy to think that, you know, it's an executive order. It applies to federal civilian, and this is where it stops. So, and, and we've seen, like I mentioned, the executive order and OMB publish and apply to federal civilian. However, soon after, in July last year, there was a national security memorandum uh, on improving cybersecurity for critical infrastructure. So think about electric companies, owners and operators of critical pipeline that is used to transfer to transport hazardous liquid material, natural gas. Think about water facilities, wastewater treatment facilities, chemical plants, public transportation, power plants, nuclear power plants, and so on. The government is, is making an effort to assert authority and, and influence all these entities to go and improve their cybersecurity. And it doesn't stop there because state and local government. So the federal government doesn't have authority over state and local government. And the way to overcome it is by allocating funds and grants. And you want to have, you know, tap into that funnel grant. Here is what you need to do. 
adopt cybersecurity uh, practices, and so on. Now, if it wasn't clear, uh, the executive order also is applicable for the Department of Defense and Intelligence community. They will have different authority for the specific guideline. So the DOD CIO will craft the guideline for DOD, NSA will craft the, the guideline for IC, but they're also in scope and they need to work on improving the cybersecurity and, and adopt zero trust. And you can expect that this will trickle down from the Department of Defense to the defense industrial base. About 300,000 companies that, that bid and want to work with the government, they will need to adhere to uh, best practices. Now, it doesn't stop there, because what we've seen is the cybersecurity authorities of the US, namely CISA, FBI, the NSA, work together with their equivalent in, US, US, uh, sorry, in UK, New Zealand, Australia, the Netherlands, and issued a joint cybersecurity advisory back in uh, May this year. So this is now going to other government. And you should expect also that every regulated industry, whether it is in the US or outside the US, is keeping an eye on what's going on here. So the impact of the executive order goes way beyond the federal government in the US and way beyond just the US. Now, what, what is it calling for when it comes to identity? When it comes to identity, there are three major callouts. The first one, centralized identity system. Don't have identity silos. I have this system authenticating with this identity provider and this system there. No, try to consolidate. Why? Because it gives you consistent you know, control, a, a place to enforce the policies across the board. It also calls out to improve, to strengthen the authentication. It's calling out to move the authentication enforcement, the MFA, to up per up and not at the entry. So don't think like you're getting to my network, you authenticate and I'm not gonna check. No, every app, go and check. It's calling out to use phishing resistant MFA. We'll define what it means to be phishing resistant MFA. And to improve, to strengthen password for cases where you are still using password. It also calls out to include a device signal for authorization decision. So whether you're coming from a non-managed device or not should be a factor in the way that you're making authorization decision. So when it comes to identity, the, the executive order and the memorandum refer to NIST 863 publication. NIST stands for the National Institute of Standard and Technology and they're under the Department of Commerce and one of the responsibilities that they have is provide guidance for the federal government. There is a series of publication, NIST a special publication 800 is the series and publication 63 within it is all about digital identity. And they define what are the requirements. So first thing, they talk about three factors. When you're doing MFA, you need to incorporate two of the three factors and there are certain guidelines. The first one is something you know. So password or PIN is, uh, is considered something you know. The next factor is something you have. Okay, something you have can be a key fob, can be your phone as an authentication method, can be a grid card, a lookup secret, can be a FIDO key, right? And then the last factor is something you are. Something you are is biometric elements, characteristic of a user, whether the physical or behavioral. So for example, it could be facial recognition, iris scan, fingerprint, or a voice print, right? It could also be, to some extent, typing, typing patterns and so on. All of these are considered uh, something you are. Pay attention that something you are on its own is not considered an authenticator. What it means, you can't go, just go and you know, swipe a finger and say, I'm authenticated. That's not acceptable. It can only be as part of the multi-factor authenticator. So for example, if I have a FIDO security key, and FIDO security key, for example, I don't know if you're seeing it, but here is a FIDO security key, and this is a fingerprint reader on it. So this is where I can incorporate together the uh, something you are with something you have. Now when it comes to authentication, single factor authentication is when I'm using 
one, one of the three factors. You're limited, like I mentioned, to only use something you have or something you know. Something you are cannot be uh, used to authentication on its own. Now, in this slide, on the top, we have the NIST terminology, and on the bottom, a more uh, layman terminology. So we have a user, and that user is using a memorized secret okay, to authenticate, so a password, for example. That is what we call the authenticator. As a factor, this is something you know. And that leads to a transaction against the verifier. Azure AD, for example, is an example of a, a, a verifier. Now, you may want to do multi-factor authentication. And multi-factor authentication can be done in either using two single-factor authenticators. So, for example, in this case, I have the same user. And that user is using a memorized secret, something you know. That leads to one transaction. So this is one transaction. And then I'm also using something you have. Something you have, for example, OTP, one-time password, the key fob. It could be on a phone. And that leads to a second transaction, which completes the MFA. So I have two authenticators using to complete authentication that is multi-factor. Or I can simplify the life of the user and use a single multi-factor authenticator. So for example, here, I have the user. And now that user is using a FIDO2 security key. That key has a fingerprint reader built into it. The fingerprint is something you have, and it's considered an activation factor that unlocks the access to the key that is stored in the FIDO uh, security key. Okay? And that leads to a single transaction. So unlike the previous example where I had two authenticators, each one leading to a transaction against the a identity provider. Here I have a single transaction that basically is, is multi-factor. Now, let's talk about phishing. So how does a typical phishing attack look like? In most cases, you're getting an email. You're unsuspecting. It looks, it looks completely legit. It has a link to a site that you assume is legit. You're clicking on that link. And that site lures you into authenticating. You're authenticating, and the malicious site can turn around and use the authentication output in order to authenticate to the legit site. Now, how do we throw off attacks like that? We do it by leveraging a phishing-resistant multi-factor authentication. So let's look at the scenario here. I have the user. The user have an authenticator, let's think about it as a FIDO2 security key. And in the middle, I have the malicious site. On the one hand, that malicious site, or, or sorry, the malicious entity. On the one hand, the malicious entity looks like a legit site, completes the transaction. On the other hand, it looks like the user. It tried to impersonate the user against the legit site. So what happens is when I try to authenticate to any site, there is some identifier that is agreed upon that identifies the channel between us. And it's unique per transaction. So every two entities that communicate will have a unique identifier for the channel. We take the authenticator and cryptographically incorporate that identifier of the channel. So in this case, the output would be something that proves that I have A, like I have the key A. It's not the key. The key never leaves. But it's something that shows that I'm in control of the key A. And also, I'm incorporating here the channel identifier, 1. And now you have something that combines both the proof that I have the key, as well as this is bound to this channel. Now what happens is if that malicious entity tries to reuse it, they're going to open another channel against the legitimate site. But guess what? The identifier for the communication between them is going to be different. And all they can do, because they don't have the key, right? A, the key never leaves the, uh, the, uh, uh, the key itself, right? The key never 
The private key never leaves the FIDO security key. And because of that, all they can do is just replay what they have. So they're rippling A1, and the legit verifier looks at A1 and say, I was expecting A2, something that binds you to our channel, not something that you brought from somewhere else. And because it's not a match, I'm going to reject it. And this is how we basically throw off phishing attack. And this is per NIST. This is how NIST define a phishing resistant. And with that, let's have Melanie talk about the why passwordless and the passwordless promise. Thanks, Ehud. Uh, so why passwordless? So really quick story. I have a son who's 10 years old and he came to me the other day and said, hey mom, I want to download this kid chess app. He wants to play chess on the phone. And I said, okay, but he needed to create a login. So he went forward with it. He decided to put his gamer tag for his username and put in a password and it came up with an error. And I said, well, let me look at that. Well, maybe it's just the network or something. Let's refresh it and try again. So we put in his, the same username and password, and it still came up with an error. And I said, son, what did you put for the password? Guess what he chose? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> it starts at a young age, folks. It's human nature. It's the path of least resistance, right? You just, you don't want to have to think about it. Passwords should not be the basis of your security, right? Um, and they can be easily guessed. And, um, and predicted. Um, as Ehud demonstrated, passwords plus MFA require two single factors, and so it adds that extra friction. While it is more secure than a password, it may not be as easy to deploy and get adopted. Um, so you really want something that is that strong multi-factor uh, phishing resistant authenticator. So what is the passwordless promise? Um, remove passwords as the attack vector. Um, you probably noticed when you uh, registered for this event that you just got sent a code. Um, that's a single factor. That's not a password. So that is a form of password list. Um, I would say this is probably less critical data than inside your organization. That's why they made it easy and simple. Um, but for your, for your own organization, you want something that's better than a single factor and, and also doesn't require a password. So that's where these strong device-based authentication methods um, come into play. Windows Hello is an example, um, and the Microsoft Authenticator app, and the FIDO2 security keys. So if we look at these on a spectrum, um, bad is password, right? Easy to guess. Um, what's less bad? Well, um, as the example, SMS um, is less bad um, you know, with a password, but even NIST doesn't recommend it. Um, it's not even listed there as a, a secure option. So you need to look beyond that. And so that's where um, this good section comes into play. So this is things like the Authenticator app where um, not only do you have the app registered on your device, but you're also responding to a prompt. It could be a push approval. It could be a, an additional code um, showing kind of proof of possession, if you will, um, for that factor. Um, One-time passcode tokens are also options. Um, that can be great for employees who maybe don't have access to the most critical data. Uh, maybe they're traveling, maybe they just need view access only, certain applications. Um, this could be a really good option. Um, but even better, and for uh, more critical uh, data and applications, would be these platform authenticators, uh, where it's built into the device, um, is encrypted, and can prevent against phishing. Um, as was shown earlier. There's actually a new kid on the block, so I'm gonna switch it now um, to passkeys. So passkeys um, are something new. How many of you have heard of passkeys? Raise your hand. Okay, see a few hands here. Um, we just released the spec in May, um, we being the FIDO Alliance, um, Google, and Apple, and we've been working together um, to create the spec so that it can be used across platforms. We're really targeting consumers here. We wanted to be able to provide an option where they can use one passkey across multiple devices. So for example, if you create um, a passkey on your Apple iPhone or your Android phone, you can use that, say, on a Windows PC on an Edge browser or on a, in a Safari browser on a MacBook. So you're able to go across platforms. We're all using the same standard, kind of like a Bluetooth standard, um, where you can easily authenticate, but it's phishing resistant. 
and that's because that biometric is created and stored locally. Those are the kind of biometrics I like. You don't want biometrics that are shared to the cloud. You want them to be stored um, and created locally. So, um, so we're really excited about this new standard. You're gonna see more and more support. Um, we're, all of us companies are working actively right now on releasing those out to the public um, and getting those, those ready. But we're really excited that at least the standard and the spec has been created. Uh, so now, how do you enable these? Let's talk about the steps. Thank you, Melanie. Okay, so how do we how do we go on the passwordless journey? And passwordless is a journey. Okay, it's going to take time, and you need to have the proper considerations. You have, a, for reference, there is a blog that covers ten reasons to love passwordless and the, the passwordless funnel and that goes into further details of what I'm gonna cover in this uh, slide. The first thing is presence in Azure AD. Recognize that the cloud is where all the innovation of passwordless is happening, whether we're talking about WebAuthn, whether we're talking about token protection, the modern protocol and standards is where the battle can be won. Trying to do passwordless while basically still relying on on-prem legacy uh, you know, technologies that have password embedded in, in, in them is counterproductive to what you're trying to do. So while legacy is there and it's going to be around, you need to make sure that the solution that you deploy is going towards passwordless and can coexist with the legacy uh, uh, applications that you have. The next thing that you need to, to consider is moving the apps to Azure AD or to a modern IDP, right? Most of the users' day-to-day -day application need to use modern authentication protocols such as OS 2.0, SAML authentication, and authorization. It's true for all of the Microsoft 365 apps already, but don't just think about the Microsoft apps because a modern IDP can have non-Microsoft app. All the other apps that you have, if they're modern, they can be connected. And like I mentioned, once you connect them to the same IDP, you are at a better position to consistently apply the, the policies that you need to adhere to. Now, the next step is ensure device readiness, right? It's an area that is, is often overlooked. When you think about Windows Hello for Business, you need to make sure that you are on the latest version of, uh, of Windows. You, know, you need to make sure that the hardware that you, uh, you use is, is supporting that, what kind of biometrics capability you have on the hardware, and so on. It is also true for the FIDO keys. And there is an, a link where you can share the latest on FIDO support AKAMS, sorry, aka.ms slash FIDO matrix. And this is where you can see all the browser and operating system where FIDO is supported. And this, is, this uh, page keeps being updated. You also need to think about the form factor of the FIDO keys that you're going to buy. Are they going to be USB, USB-C? Are they going to be Lightning, whatever, to make sure that they cover all of the scenario for the, your users. Now, the next thing is you need to complete the registration and bootstrapping. In order to enable passwordless, which is MFA, you need to register it. You need to already have an MFA, which is kind of like a catch-22. Okay, I'm starting a new user. What do I, how do I get to an MFA? So there is a, a, a process that we document of how to uh, enlist, you know, register the first MFA and then how to add the next one. There is also a capability called temporary access pass, which is a special code that is uh, usage bound, time bound, and restricted. You can be restricted to only registration of uh, new credentials. You can issue that to a user, and the user can use it to register Windows Hello for Business, Authenticator app, or FIDO2 security key. And the last thing, you, you've, you've done all this effort to register the key, but you need to drive the usage of passwordless app, okay? You want to make sure that you're driving campaigns to encourage that. There is also a new capability where you can enforce. What we did is with authentication strength, which I'm going to demo, we allow you to make authorization decision based on the authentication that was used. So you can use that in order to identify the crown jewel application and say, if you want to use this application, you have to use uh, any, any passwordless method that I approved. Now, this is, you know, you think it's all in theory, but we have here on stage with us 
Joe Kaplan from uh, Accenture, which is a, a very large company, <laughs> right? And Joe will give you some astonishing numbers to show you how it's, you know, it's done, how it can be done. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm Joe from Accenture. I want to talk a little bit about what we have been doing on our passwordless journey. Um, so first of all, just a quick level set, like uh, who had said, it's a big company uh, that's 740,000. Uh, those are, that's actually just employees. That doesn't include my 70,000 contractors and it goes on and on and on and on. Um, so big environment. Um, a little bit of a hands on our password list deployment. Um, uh, these are like generally kind of big numbers. None of these are complete. We still have plenty of work to do in all these spaces. The one that is probably the furthest behind is um, uh, people using the Authenticator app who've also done the extra step to register for phone sign-in. Um, that number needs to be a lot higher. Um, our FIDO deployment's actually intended to be kind of small. I'll explain that a little bit more later. Um, we also have a ton of apps. This number is also low. I looked this morning, it's actually 19,000 something um, registered in Azure AD. All of these things can take advantage of all of the authentication methods that are available in Azure AD, including passwordless. We have a pretty giant um, work surface of, of stuff that can be consumed through this, this channel. Okay, so why do this? Um, hopefully it's pretty clear by now that uh, the primary reason you would want to do this is because it's a lot more secure. That's been the reason that the way we've sold this internally is risk reduction from the get-go. Uh, we believe that moving in this direction will make us more secure because passwords are the weakest link in the chain for all of authentication. However, there's more to it than that. Um, it is a rare treat in the world of security professionals to have an opportunity to actually improve the user experience of your subjects while you're actually making them more secure. And this is maybe the only time in your entire career where you get to do that. Because um, passwordless is actually a lot easier to use than uh, dealing with passwords. And even when you're starting off with pins, and you will be deploying pins as part of any kind of passwordless deployment, it's, it's really nice to get biometrics everywhere, but you should set your expectations that there will be lots of pins, and um, bio is generally a little bit more of a nice to have. Um, but uh, a thing that th I want, would also caution you with, with uh, pins, don't ruin pins for end users from a usability perspective. Um, there's ever, all the kit is in the configurations to make them just as awful to use as passwords if you want to do that. And that is not the right way to think about these things. Uh, pins are defined by something that is authenticated at the device itself. It's never authenticated online. The threat model is totally different. You don't have to have enormously complicated um, pins in order to have them be protected. Six digit numeric, non expiring, it's great. Do that. Um, I already talked a little bit about biometrics, but most of our experience for our employees is really pins um, for logging into stuff because we don't have biometrics on all of our laptops. You can add them aftermarket if you want to, and some of our laptops have them. Um, not all of our FIDO tokens support them either. Um, your phone may or may not have it, depending on what phone you have, but um, biometrics are a part of it, but they're not the only thing. So a little bit on our journey. Um, and who talked uh, about the, the funnel? And I think that's actually a, probably a better like structured methodology um, to follow in terms of how you would want to go about doing this. But there's two things I would point out here. So as you can see, we've been working on this for four years now. Um, the, the thing I will tell you is that it won't take you that long. We, we jumped into this when the technology was pretty immature and a lot of the road was being paved in front of us. And it, FIDO didn't even really exist as a spec that you can consume. Authenticator phone sign-in didn't exist. TAP didn't exist. Hello for Business was pretty immature. So we bled a lot to get in on this er earlier. You can do this a lot faster and a lot less expensively than we did. The other thing I want to highlight on here is that our big goal, the thing that we're trying to do that is actually really, really hard, is actually full password elimination. So it's one thing to give people the password replacement alternatives to actually take away the password so that you don't have a password, don't know what your password is, and never need it for anything, is that's our current goal. That is the big rock that we are trying to move. And um, that is what I'm going to spend the next fiscal year trying to, uh, to get done for, for our workforce. Um, so a couple of, like, how, how did we get to being able to do this? A big piece of it 
for us was commitment to, uh, to being an Azure AD shop. Um, so I said we have 19,000 applications in Azure AD. A big piece of how that happened was we, I used to have 13,000 apps in ADFS, and that entire workload migrated to um, Azure AD. So it was a pretty big commitment for us to do that. Um, but we reduced our attack surface really substantially by doing that. We also uh, save a lot of cost because guess what? We're already paying for Azure AD. It does the exact same thing a lot better. You don't really need that other thing. And we, you know, we had really, really substantial IaaS spend running a, an ADS farm, a ADFS farm with like 120 servers and stuff in it. So, um, yeah, this actually was tremendously beneficial for us across a whole bunch of different things. Um, so talk, this is the thing I like to talk about the most. But so what is our mix of stuff? The first thing to know is that password for, password list for us is all of these things. Um, so it is hello for business, but hello for business for the Windows user. They got lots of Mac users and stuff like that. They don't get to use hello for business. That's not for them. Um, Authenticator is for everyone. And this is the Authenticator with the phone sign-in feature. The one uh, thing I would tell you is that this is by far the easiest thing to deploy in your organization, especially if you've already um, opted in for Authenticator. Turn it on and try and convince your people to do the extra step on their device to enable it, which is the thing that we struggle with, just like not even noticing that you got to click a thing to opt in to use it. But this will vastly improve your security because now you're no longer using a password to sign into stuff. And you can get this out. It works across a whole bunch of different channels. You can't sign into Windows with it unless you're Azure AD join yet. It'll get there. But um, this is also your reach solution to log into your mobile devices, personal devices, what, your Macs, um, potentially are a good way to, to pivot off of those. But don't snooze on this feature. It's really, really important. Um, FIDO2, so our goal is to keep our FIDO footprint as small as we possibly can. Um, because I don't want, I could easily spend $100 million getting FIDO tokens to that many people by the time I buy all the tokens and then move them all around the world and hand them out to people and then replace all the ones that people lost or ran through the washing machine and whatnot. I do not want to do that. We want to use them in special specific spots like administrators and uh, our, our help desk people are going from machine to machine to machine, people who need to move around and need a roaming credential. But I don't want to actually have to do FIDO tokens for everyone because it's difficult and expensive to deal with the separate hardware thing. A thing that you may want to think about too is that a lot of the FIDO tokens also support the PIV smart card um, protocol. So if you are a smart card shop, you can get these consolidated down to a single de device and your administrators will love you for that. Um, then don't snooze on temporary access pass as well. It's a thing that allows you to securely bootstrap and get um, people set up with these technologies. Because like, that, that's the thing. Like, OK, so how, am I, how do I set up passwordless uh, for the first time on a device um, if I don't have a password? Like, what is that thing that I use? And the thing that you use is this. And you're, so temporary access pass is kind of magical because it is a password. It's, uh, it's limited in use both in time and number of uses. Um, it is treated as MFA by the Azure AD platform. So it's also really powerful and really dangerous. Um, but we built a whole bunch of stuff to enable help test to give these out to people as well as some self-service tools. So I can go to a site, log in, get myself a temporary access pass so I can set up my new phone and I don't have to go through help test to do that. So, um, the things that are making it difficult for me to actually get the last mile to take passwords away from people. So we still have hybrid workstations. At first time log into a hybrid workstation, still you either need a password or a FIDO token. That's kind of it. Um, and we are moving to Azure AD workstations, but I have a million uh, workstations I got to get through, and that's, that's a lot. So. Um, what we have decided to do is create a self-service capability to allow people to get their password back briefly, and then when they're done with it, uh, so they log into the workstation the first time, they set up a low for business, and then they can turn themselves back off and go back to passwordless. But we decided that we didn't want to hold off on this thing just for that one thing, because everyone in, in the company needs this, but not very often, because you don't get a new workstation that often, hopefully. So. Um, 
So that was a big investment for us. I'm not going to steal Ehud's thunder on some of his other, uh, other stuff um, here, as some of our blockers, because he's going to show you some, uh, some uh, demos that make some of my dreams come true here. But um, just want to uh, hopefully motivate you that if we can do it, you can do it. And I definitely think you should do it. And I will be happy to answer any questions, uh, hand out my pro tips during Q&A if we still got time. So yeah. well, thank you. Thank you, Joe. I don't know about you, but the numbers are just astonishing. Think about it, 740,000 users going passwordless. So that is crazy big. Now, Accenture and many other uh, partners that we work with gave us the feedback that remote desktop support for passwordless is critical. So think about you're connecting to another VM and you want to use passwordless. And today, RDP protocol is limited to supporting basically uh, passwords or certificates. And what I'd like to show you is a demo. Okay. And what we're going to see in this demo is what we've done in order to address the remote desktop problem. So I'm, I'm using the remote desktop client and I'm going to use it to subscribe uh, to a, basically a workspace that contains all my Azure Virtual Desktop and Azure uh, Virtual uh, Application. So now this is a modern app. I can use any sort of credential that's supported by Azure AD. And in this case, I'm going to use the phone sign-in. So phone sign-in, as we mentioned, this is a passwordless method. Um, I got a notification here, 37 is the code. I'm going to enter the code, scan my face, and voila, I'm in. So passwordless to get in. Now I'm going to see the list of resources. I have a virtual desktop. Now this virtual desktop is using, the connection is using RDP. The RDP protocol didn't support passwordless. We changed that. So now, I'm basically connecting, and you'll see, seamless SSO. I'm just getting in because I already signed with MFA, with the phone sign in. So now I'm in the remote desktop. OK? Let's see, sorry. OK. Let's take time to load. OK. So now that I'm in a remote desktop, I mentioned authentication strength. So let's see what authentication strength provides me. Come on. Sorry for the slowness of the environment. OK. So authentication strength, I have a set of pre-built authentication strength. I have MFA, I have passwordless, phishing resistant MFA. I can also build my own, build a custom one. So in this case, I defined one that is specifically requiring FIDO or Windows or Law for Business. Via conditional access policy, I can require specific authentication method for a specific app. I can also leave it at a higher level as MFA. So I have here a CA policy targeting one app, and that is requiring MFA. And then I have another CA policy that is targeting another app that is sensitive. And for this app, I want to require a higher assurance authentication. Namely, in this case, I would like it to use FIDO or Windows Law for Business. And you can see that on the right side, I've required FIDO slash Windows Law for Business. Now, let's look at what happens if I'm trying to access the app that simply requires MFA. Okay? I'm getting in. I didn't authenticate. What happened? The reason is the remote desktop that I connected to, I connected with MFA. As soon as I connected, the remote desktop goes to Azure AD, acquires a primary refresh token or a PRT that contains an MFA claim, saying the user already signed in with MFA. Let's not make the life of the user too hard and accept that. So because I already have a token that says I am MFA'd, 
I am not required to MFA. Now let's see what happens if I'm going to the app that requires specific method. And remember, I didn't use FIDO or Windows Hello for business. I used the Authenticator app, right? So what you'll see now is that I'm required to authenticate with a security key. Okay. Now think about the scenario. This is the rem from the remote desktop to a remote app I'm trying to connect. How am I going to use the FIDO key that's connected to my machine? It's connected to the local machine, not the, lo not the remote desktop. The answer? Similar to what we did with SmartCard, because in SmartCard there is SmartCard redirection. You redirect the request for authentication from the remote desktop to the local machine. We've done the same with basically WebAuthn. So WebAuthn is a protocol that used in order to generate FIDO. I am now going to put my fingerprint and voila, I'm in. So this basically solved the passwordless need, you know, support for remote desktop to the remote desktop and from the remote desktop. Okay, and with that, Melanie, back to you. Thank you. Um, just the last few minutes, I um, wanted to talk about some key takeaways and some resources for you to go forward. Um, like you said, we're really closing those gaps, um, and there's a lot more options today than there have been in the past. It's not just a dream. Um, it's definitely a reality today. Um, as our CISO has said, hackers don't break in, they log in. And so identity should really be at the core of your security. Um, so that's the number one, um, not to rely on passwords. Um, start looking at your options. Number two, don't get in your user's way. I bet you have um, some folks at your company who do have some of these platform authenticators or authenticator apps. Um, allowing them to use those to log in, it, sometimes it's just the switch of a button in um, your identity provider like Azure AD. Um, and then targeting some different groups that have you know, perhaps higher restrictive access um, or that you know, maybe travel a lot that you want to start using these and um, choose the right authenticator for them depending on the use case. And then lastly, uh, progress over perfection. So again, uh, to quote perhaps what about Bob, uh, baby steps. So you, know, you gotta take one little step at a time and um, you know, it might be starting with apps, it might be starting with certain groups, but um, it's kind of like if you're still using Internet Explorer, you just have to move on. It's time to go forward. Um, it's time to move on to these <laughs> a bunch of different um, authenticator options available for you. So um, I hope you feel empowered to go forward with passwordless and please um, use these resources. Um, if you go to this first one, aka.ms slash go passwordless, it has most all of these links uh, from that one. And then we also have um, Accenture's case study more in depth um, where you, on their site that you can go to as well. And then of course you can reach out to any of us three if you want more information about how to help your company go forward. But we really do think um, you know, it's the best way forward for the risk and security of your company. Um, and we're really excited about where Passwordless is going. And we have about one minute for questions, uh, if there's any burning uh, questions, and, and we can also stay after as well. Yeah, I had a, I had a quick one. Uh, out of, in our company, we've got either using that six-digit authenticator or using click approve, or now, and now we're rolling out that two-digit uh, mechanism, right? Out of these three, are all of them uh, safe from proxy, MFA proxy attacks? So, do you want to guess one? So I, I'm not sure I understood the connection to the proxy here. The replay, the replay of the MFA. Can, can I spoof the phishing site? Okay. So, okay. So if your question is if the authenticator app is phishing resistant or not, is that the question? So it's not at the moment. No. Currently, the authenticator app is not phishing resistant. That's why it wasn't on the list. The methods that are phishing resistant. The government is using certificates. Certificate is obviously phishing resistant, and we now support Azure AD certificate-based authentication natively in Azure, uh, in Azure AD, FIDO2, and Windows Hello for Windows. These are the methods that are phishing resistant, and you can go with any one of them to be protected. The authenticator, you can 
Um, you can basically add the requirement to use it from a managed device and that give, gives you some level of phishing resistance. It's not what CISA is trying to drive. CISA is trying to drive a usage of FIDO and PKI. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, so just and Windows Allow for Business included in the FIDO. Yeah, just to add to that, um, you know, majority of attacks are focused on the password-based, and so any kind of MFA will protect you against yes. like 99.9% .9 yeah. of attacks. But if you're looking for strongest of the strongest, um, at this point, Authenticator app is not as you know phishing yeah. resistant as um, something like a platform authenticator. Yeah. Yeah, with the with, uh, advent of remote workers, I got two questions about enrollment and lost credentials, right? Oh, so okay. if you send a, a YubiKey or a new laptop and they enroll in, authentic in Hello or their YubiKey, how <laughs> do you know that that's the actual person? Is there any proofing you have? So the way that we do this um, is Okay, so let's let, let's assume that you have one device and uh, and you need to enroll another one. So, like, I've got my laptop and I'm going to enroll a FIDO token. So, th what we will do is we will send you off to the uh, the cloud-based um, registration site at the Microsoft portal that does security device registration. We'll have a CA policy requiring that you use a managed device to log into that so that you can actually make changes there um, and. Uh, and we'll, we'll do it that way. Or if we need to, we will try to give you a way to get a temporary access pass to, um, uh, to log into that site. It's a very sensitive operation. There's a lot of really interesting stuff to think about in terms of how you do your secure bootstrapping. And there are certain things that may be more sensitive than others that you want to think about. So lots, lots of stuff there. But there, there's a bunch of stuff in the kit to give you um, a, a fair bit of control over how you do those things, depending on your deployment model. Thank you. Thank you.